I'm Stuart Chadwick and this is my colleague Nina and we're here today to talk to you about our Learning Insights Report which is a research report we've been doing for four years now into the L&D industry. So, if you're all ready we're going to make a start. So this is us, um, I'm Global Solutions Director at Kineo and Nina's uh, an Account Director. Um, if you want to talk about any of the concepts we talk about today after this session we're on Stand B12 which is literally just there so nice and easy. And if you want to tweet about this or share anything online, then our uh, handles are at Kineo and hashtag Kineo Expert. Very quick bit about us. Um, City and Guilds Kineo, if you don't know us already, we are part of City and Guilds. Uh, we develop learning technology solutions and vocational learning qualifications and uh, accreditation. We've been around for 10 years now as a learning technology business. And as part of City and Guilds, 130 years. So we're a much older company. Um, and we're global, we work in the UK here, but we have offices in the US and the Pacific, South Africa and other places too. And we provide a whole range of different services from things like e-learning. <laughs> yeah, we'll get by, you're right, no worries. <laughs> um, to body learning solutions, digital learning, so it's everything from courses to interactive video to gamification. Um, to infographics and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, we provide learning management system solutions, and like I say, also blends and consultancy and accreditation that goes around all that too. So that's a bit about us. But not, we're not here to talk about us. We're much, is it on land? Uh, we're here to talk about our report. So that's why we're here today. So we've been doing this report now with eLearning Age. It's okay. Sorry, we've been doing this report now for, for three years and this is actually our fourth. And each year what we've done is we've interviewed around 30 to 40 learning and development professionals, so people like yourselves and other clients that we work with, to get their views on what's actually happening in the L&D world. Not what we perceive and talk about is happening, but what's really going on on the ground. So each year we've identified a number of key themes and based on reports around that. And this year's report is just about to be released based on interviews that we did at the tail end of last year. If you leave us a card, we're doing a limited print run of these reports and you can get a printed copy. Otherwise, it'll be digital and online in the very near future. Sorry about the noise. Not sure what to do about that. So, as a basis for these reports, we ask people a number of questions. And uh, here are some of those. They're not the only ones that we ask. Basically, at Kino being 10 years old, what we wanted to do was to get L&D professionals to reflect on what they've learned over the last 10 years and what's coming up for the next 10 years for them. Oh, thank you. That's better. So some of the things we asked were things like how have learners' expectations changed, what technologies had a big impact for them, what's been the biggest um, surprise they've had in the last 10 years, what's making changes to the workplace, and some other questions along those lines. And we're going to explore those points as we go through our presentation today. Now, one of the things that really struck us is when we finished doing the interviews and started to compile this report, is we found a lot of the same things were being said as had been said for the last three years of doing this report. And they weren't just the things about what people had been doing, but they were the things that people are still aspiring to do. So as an example, for the last few years, we've all been seeing a big introduction of smartphones and tablets, and that's having an impact on the workplace. And pretty much everything we design and develop in e-learning terms now is built across all those devices. However, when in reality, if you monitor the stats, less people are actually using them across all those devices than you might expect. Likewise, learning management systems, we've heard people for several years saying, our LMS is great for managing our, our courses and traditional learning, but less great at uh, keeping up to speed with things like informal and social learning. So LMS needs to evolve. But we aren't really seeing that happening as much as we'd like in reality. Another example might be user-generated content people recognise that learners, individuals, ourselves, are much more used to sharing through the likes of Facebook and Twitter and other channels. And, and we'd like to harness that in our businesses to get people to share what they know. But they're not perhaps doing it as much as we would expect. And we're not perhaps putting the right frameworks and methodologies in to do that. So this led us to thinking, well, what is it that's stopping this from happening? Why are we not progressing as much as we'd like to? Why are these still things continuing to be aspirations after several years of this report. So what happened? I'm going to pass you on to Nina now who's going to start exploring that further. Okay. So we've moved into a time where we have many apps and devices being used in multiples of different ways. 
And the diagram of us moving through the time shows us coming from a single well-defined point of technology through to the expansion of technology without necessarily that mature refinement in its use. In the last 10 years, the biggest change has been the movement of the web and all our changing habits and behaviours involving technology. University research in the UK suggests that we check our smartphones on average 85 times a day and that over 50% of that is for no more than 30 seconds. This adds up to several hours of smartphone usage every day. And of course, it's purely around social activity, listening to music, web browsing and interacting with apps. But many of our interviewees felt that the effect of our relationship with technology outside of the workplace and the expectations of people and how they use it shouldn't be underestimated. Learners now expect instant, easily available learning, content that's quick to go, it's bang up to date, and looks and feels in the same way as their games and applications that they do outside of the workplace. Searching for the true north inside our digital blizzard was how one person described the best way to deliver workplace in the learning in, uh, work, learning in the workplace. It's easy to be sidetracked by technology and be overwhelmed by the alternatives. And this slide shows just some of the common themes in the workplace that learning and development are having to deal with on a daily basis. There are loads of great trends in learning and technologies, and we're building greater understanding of the expectations of our learners on a daily basis. But so many workplaces are still hindered by lockdown or out-of-date infrastructures. And as such, we should be just as much focusing on the user and making the best of what we have within the constraints of what we have, rather than always chasing the latest trend. As we move through this presentation, we'll talk more about the digital storm. But it's important to note that it's, the storm is greater than the technology in itself. The storm of technology is the driver of the change, but the ultimate output is the impact and the changes on the workplace and the behaviours of the people that we serve on a daily basis. This was very apparent in the report from our L&D experts, who found that they were not only needing to keep up with the changes of the learner, but also with the technology and the demands of the business within much, much tighter constraints than before. This is demonstrated really well in a quote from one of our interviewees who references everyone understands the implications of the digital revolution. How often we often find ourselves paralysed by the enormity and complexity of this agenda. His question to himself is, where do we start? So, part of this presentation is looking about how we find our way through the digital storm for, to our true north. On the next slide, we put out some certain areas about how we find our way. It's about focusing on the learner and what they need. It's about avoid getting fixated on the latest new things, but still being open to try things. So for instance, if social learning is not great for your work environment or you believe culturally it's not quite well suited, it's okay that you're not doing it and everybody else is. But equally, don't be frightened to test things out. You might be pleasantly surprised. There's no need for your team to be an industry setter through their own capabilities. Look across the business about whether there are wider capabilities in your business that you can leverage. Build good relationships with your suppliers who will define your strategies for the now, evaluate the future, but will also take some of the accountability for keeping you ahead of the game. When your learning has no commercial output, the learning still needs to be commercially aligned to the business. Invest in learning not for the purposes of ticking a box or because it's what everybody's doing. Set pragmatic and measurable objectives in both the purposes of the learning and the learning, object learning objectives. Look to your return on investment and your savings on investment, but most importantly, make sure it creates a valuable business impact. Whether that's in less accidents, greater sales, or better customer service, we should ultimately be aiming for a better impact. Learning can then become more targeted, better invested, 
with learners more engaged, with a greater retention of learning, which ultimately leads to increased capability. A show like Learning Technologies is a great way for being able to focus on what you want to do for this year. Take the enormity of it and scale it down to something that's realistic for you and your business. Lots of mini pilots are always better than the Big Bang. And there are many suppliers here today who will be happy to support pilots with sand pits or basic solutions at low to no cost, making it a great way for you to trial new technology without the risk and without the cost implications. Encourage your suppliers to work in collaboration with each other. The ultimate blend may not sit within one supplier, and as such, any competitive barriers must be dropped to the benefit of yourselves. Use networks, networking opportunities, and your suppliers as an opportunity to speak to other companies about what they're doing. Explore through their journeys what's worked well for them and what hasn't. Also listen to your learners. They are the people who know what they want and will help you achieve a learner-centric solution that is business objective-led. So over the next few slides, we're going to start talking to you in a little bit more detail about how we make our way through the blizzard to our true north. And we've broken this down into three sections. We're going to take a quick look at the tools, your team, and the camp, which is essentially the workplace. So we start with the tools. When we look over learning for the last 10 years and what we examined through the report, there were some key things that we can call on and not all of these are going to be that unique to you. We are much more focused on bite-sized learning, so out with the long-winded courses. And this comes from a place where people want to be able to find what they need at the moment of which they need it. This should be a given, really, but bin the boring. E-learning in some places has become a dirty word, and our learners associate it with monotonous, paginated pages of interactions. Explore digital apps, games, animations, even the something as simple as a PDF can be interesting. Many organizations, as we mentioned earlier, still face barriers around lockdown devices and out-of-date infrastructure. We must keep beating the drum to make sure that we put learning separate from the other security boundaries that business applications face. We should be more Google and less proprietary about our knowledge. Why reinvent the wheel for learning that has no competitive influence on you or your market? Allow yourself to curate your content and not necessarily create it. Let's be concerned with impact and not how many people took the learning. If the learning has impacted the business in a measurable way, you know it's been successful. Embrace social learning. If your audience, work environment, and culture enable it, consider, plan, and strategize for your social learning. Social learning naturally plays to decentralization of top-down learning, and it forms a common part of our 10% in the blend. Allow learning on many devices to give your learners the flexibility to learn whenever they want. Intelligent blends that make the best of real-world experience and simulated practice. And finally, focus on reward. What's it in it for your learner to become more accountable about their own learning requirements? The freer way of learning has proved that it naturally makes learners more motivated to take personal ownership for their learning needs. We also found from our interviewees that they've taken a much wider interest in things like qualifications and accreditations. And inevitably, it would be very easy for us to say that now that we're part of City and Guilds, but that genuinely came out of the report. But it means it's used as a means of reward, retention, and also as a mark of quality for the training that's then delivered. Over to you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Nina. Can you hear me? No, it's gone quiet, hasn't it? <laughs> I'll have to shout. OK, so Nina's there has taken you through some of the um, tools that we can use to help find our way through this, uh, this digital, digital expedition to our, our true north. I'm going to talk to you now about the team that we have on that journey with us. And there's a number of people in that team. There's learners, of course. They're the people that we're trying to, to get there. There's ourselves as L&D professionals and the things that we need to do. We also have our business stakeholders. 
um, and their needs and what they're trying to achieve in the business and us as L&D professionals delivering to them. And then of course you have suppliers like ourselves, Kineo, and the many others that you'll meet here who help you along the way too. Now we're not going to take all of those four today because we don't have time, but we're going to look at learners and we're going to look at L&D professionals. And I've put up here one of the mind maps from our report, you'll get all these in the report, so don't worry, you can't see all the detail there, um, about how learner expectations have changed, that being one of the questions that we asked to our interviewees. And I've summarised here the key areas that came out of that. So this is our learner, uh, our, 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 uh, our metaphorical learner on a digital expedition. Um, we know that they use multiple devices and they use of switching between those, so we need to make sure our solutions work across those and encourage that usage. We also know that, that they or we are very used to going and using Google and YouTube and the likes to get the answers that we need for a particular situations. As an example, just this weekend I needed to fix our boiler, genuinely, and I went and Googled it and looked up a video and it told me what things I needed to adjust. I went away and did that and it worked, thankfully. Um, so I learned, did a little piece of learning just by going to find it myself. And learners are doing that, we're doing that all the time. So we need to be able to bring that to the workplace and recognise that that's the way people are wanting to learn, hence the need for more bite-sized or micro-learning and assets to help people support people learning in that kind of a way and getting that instant gratification of what they want. Um, through this, people are taking charge for their learning and indeed charge for their own career. So we need to support them in doing that. And um, they're looking for a personal experience, really. So that kind of sheep dip one fit all training only really has so much mileage for these type of learners. I love a couple of key points is that they are multi-location. So people are working from home, they're working from the workplace. If the workplace can be all over the place, they're traveling. So we need to meet those needs for our digital solutions. And they're multi-generational. It's shown now that I think there's four generations of people going through the workplace at the moment, and a lot of skills locked up in the older generations. So we need to find ways of unlocking that skill and that knowledge and sharing it with the younger ones. And that isn't just going to come through from formal training. That's where your vocational, so your vocational learning and your um, uh, informal learning, your 70 out of the 70, 20, 10 is coming in. So we need to embrace that and find ways to unlock it. But also when you hear people talking about Generation Y and that these people have a unique take on learning, yeah, that's true to an extent that young people have perhaps more of this in the mix, but it's not untrue of all the other generations too because they're all Googling and YouTubing as well. So a lot of these characteristics are true across the generations of our workplace workers. As L&D specialists, you may be a bit like this or on the journey to being like this, but certainly this was the aspiration that we picked up from our interviewees. People want to be better aligned to their business needs so that when they're developing training programs or trying to create cultures of learning, that those things are based around what the business is trying to actually achieve and then they're evidencing that by measuring the impact of the learning and whether it created real retention and that really needs to start happening more. Uh, of course they need to listen to learners because we're not uh, trying to just lock up knowledge and transfer it through uh, directive training anymore but actually recognise that we need to access that learning from those who have the knowledge, which all the, all the people in our businesses. So we need to work with the learners to help unlock that and share that and support them in doing so. The line manager continues to be super important because they are a go-between through to lots of your, your learner audience. So as L&D professionals, we need to work with them as well because they're part of the gatekeeper and they can support us making this a, a reality. We talked a lot about social learning already and the need to embrace new technology. I think that the trick here is not to be overwhelmed by all the things that you're going to see at shows like this today, but actually see the things that you think, you know what, that thing was interesting and I think it might be useful for our business and for my learners and take those things and filter them down so that they're useful to you rather than trying to do everything. Um, so the workplace is becoming much more diverse, our learners are changing and we as L&D professionals need to reflect that change as well. Now I'm going to take you back to Nina who's going to talk about the workplace itself. Workplace is a changing beast, driven by need, scale, reach, and of course, technology. And as Stuart mentioned, these are available in the report if you want to look at them in a bit more detail. So I'm taking over from your clicker. <laughs> um, an increasing number of people working non-standard hours or from home these days. This is quite prevalent in the UK, where there's even been the introduction of new laws to enable flexible working for all employees. This is also extended to workplace learning. One of the L&D professionals that we interviewed commented that there's now an expectation from most learners that they can learn however they want, when they want. And that can apply to learners all around the world. The growth of the internet has made it possible to communicate globally. 
And this is something that people are keen to do in both sharing knowledge and understanding. As well as allowing for flexibilities, employers are also recognising that there is a more transitional workforce who move from place to place rather than staying in one job for long periods of time. This puts additional pressure on employers to sufficiently motivate and engage their employees so that they stick around for a bit longer. From a development perspective, the challenge is needing to train employees to do their jobs well whilst recognising that they have no loyalty to stay with you for a long period of time. So what it comes down to is that the ROI on your training investment is most likely going to start looking very poor. But which it brings us back to the greater focus on the measuring of success of the learning inside of the business through the impact means that we put more focus on the long-term impact of the training investment rather than the short-term against the learner. Through greater automation, more flexibility, higher turnover and globalisation, we have less employees doing more with increased technology usage. We have less employees in a single location, with an increase on the amount of people who are working from home. And despite the decentralisation at global level, the online connection has meant that we are far more connected, more collaborative and aligned globally than we ever have been in the past. This all leads to our workplace of the now and the future, being less of the one of the big building that we saw on the previous slide, where we had thousands of people chomping away nine till five, and is now made up of many small hubs of people, globally working together, following the sun and achieving more in less time, with less people, and yet with greater flexibility. But most importantly, through great learning and a more coherent and holistic strategy in the use of technology, the business impact will be greater, and that will be thanks to a more capable and better educated workforce. Thank you, Nina. So if we... Shut up. <laughs> so if we take a combination of those three concepts, the tools that we have at our disposal, picking the right ones for our situation, the team that we have along the way with us, our learners, our L&D professionals, our business stakeholders and our suppliers to support us and understanding their needs and how to use them together. And then what our workplace, our base camp's like and how that's changed and how it's more transitional and what impact that has. Combining knowledge of those things we think can generally help you to filter through the noise and help you find your way to the, the digital true north that you're hoping to, to achieve. Now rather than stop there, we just thought we'd share a few of the true norths that some of our interviewees are heading towards at the moment. So I won't dwell on this slide for too long, again it's in the report, and but what's on the top priorities for L&D professionals that we talked to? So some of these included upskilling the L&D team to become more digitally aware and to work better with the business and their learners, make better use of data, we haven't talked about big data or small data um, indeed um, today. Um, but uh, people recognise that locked up in their LMSs, in other areas of their business, they've got a lot of information about the learners and what they're doing and what they're interested in, and they want to better access that. Making smarter blends, so we're taking all these different things we've got at our disposal, we're not just taking a bit of e-learning and bolting onto a bit of face-to-face -face training, but we're trying to produce a much more curated uh, experience, um, and that's something we can talk to you a little bit more outside of this presentation. Also, people are trying to create a genuine learning culture, not just courses. It's about that whole 70, 20, 10 mix and how we embrace the whole lot. And lastly, really, that important point about recognising the impact we're trying to achieve on the business and measuring our performance against that impact is, is, is again, high on people's agendas. Oh, I pushed the wrong button. That wasn't very clever, was it? <laughs> um, that's it. Ah. For some reason the last slide's dropped off, that's one of weird. <laughs> we'll leave this one up there. For a, <laughs> we had a nice quote at the end where one of our um, interviewees talked about the fact that for them, when they've become to work more in this way, they found it uh, to be much more enjoyable and fluid experience where they're trying things out, they're putting them out into the business and trying those with their different stakeholders to get to the end goal that they wanted to achieve. So um, apologies, we lost the last slide there, but that pretty much wraps up what we wanted to say. And um, if you want to explore any of these concepts further, we're just there on stand B12. Please come and have a chat um, or about any of the things that, many things that we do. But actually, we've probably got five minutes, probably because I lost the last couple of slides, um, in which we can take a few questions as well. So um, if you've got anything that's on the tip of your brain, shout it out and we'll do our best to answer.
Well, thank you very much for giving us your time today. I hope you really enjoy learning technologies. Thanks for so many of you coming along. It's really great to see you. Thank you. Thank you.